Hello everyone and welcome to Island Life Exhibition Zoom Panel Discussion. My name is Mirka Goldenham and I am resident artist and head of visual arts at Wiltshire Creative. The exhibition Island Life is an exhibition produced as part of Salisbury International Arts Festival 2022 by Wiltshire Creative and is curated by Dr. Jackie Tan and myself. It is customary that our international arts festivals are created around a theme. The theme for this year is islands. Since I personally come from a landlocked country in the center of Europe, which qualifies me very little in terms of offering a lived experience on this theme, I am really extremely very pleased that Jack agreed to join me on this project. Jack originally comes from Singapore, a small island in Southeast Asia, located at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. And uh, jointly, we decided that we would turn away from the Eurocentric ideas and representations of what island is. And instead, we would seek out artists who are islanders and who will bring to the debate their own realities and experiences. So I'm very pleased to welcome here with me today, Jack, and the exhibition artist, Dr. Gail Chongquan, Marta Atienza, June Mills, and Clifton Powell. And I will now hand over to Jack to lead the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mirka. Um... And it's, I'm so pleased to be able to get everybody here in this uh, discussion today. So uh, it's just going to be a, a discussion about um, what we think of the idea of islands, how you identify with it, and how it intersects with your practice or your thinking, uh, and how it informs your work. And But before we start, I just wanted to ask if we could all just introduce ourselves. I live in southwest Scotland um, in a small village of 300 people. Uh, I would say the UK is an island. Uh, and, I want, and, you know, I'm very interested. Maybe I'm going to ask you guys later about what you think about island mentality, because we definitely have an island mentality here. Uh, but I come from Singapore, a very small island. Hi, uh, thank you for having me, for inviting me. Um, and it, it's nice to finally uh, meet some people outside <laughs> because, yeah, I'm here on an island. Uh, I'm Marta Atienza. Uh, my mother is Dutch. My father is Filipino. And I've actually moved back and forth between the Philippines and the Netherlands my whole life. And I'm 40 years old now, and I've been pretty much back in the Philippines for the last 10 years or more. Um, working on projects here, specifically on Bantayan Island. I, I think that's important to give that background because I, you know, um, I have lived in Europe and I grew up with a Dutch mother. So even, even living here on the, on the island in the Philippines, um, the discussions I have maybe are different from normal families here. Um, yeah. June, would you like to say a few words? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm June Mills from uh, Latakia country, which is the top of uh, Australia, what you'd know as Australia. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for inviting me in and thank you so much for, um, I think, very lovely, lovely um, wisdom and, and very good thinking about running this exhibition as islands. I think it's just very lovely because as we know, they're remote. They don't get near enough exposure or media or anything about their, uh, you know, day-to-day -day life. Their polit we don't hear very much. And I think it's very wise of you to choose this as a exhibition. And I thank you for that. You know, it's, it's very lovely. Um, further from that, um, you know, I'm a political activist as amongst a lot of things. <laughs> um, the thing that, that I'm very big on at the moment, as I suppose many of you are, is West Papua, who, as you know, is a 
got a media blockade blockade on it. So I suppose this is what prompting me to speak like that, mm-hmm. knowing how how urgent the situation is and how how little control they have over how they're represented or even any message that's getting out. The only real communications we get that are very truthful and, and we can trust are just using social media. And so, again, I, I, I go back to the point that I think you're very wise and kind to, to choose this as a subject for your exhibition, you know. You really extending that hand of assistance in a sense Uh, like a little bit of a leg up, Um, even though it may be just through artists, um, a handful of artists from a diverse um, background, which is very lovely. And we're all going to bring forward um, um, insights and knowledges. Mm. I think... um... Can you still hear us, June? This is the problem with islands. Yes. I get very bad uh, internet connections here as well, even though, like, it's not really an island. But there's something about not being near urban or metropolitan centres where um, and you're on the periphery and where the um, services are just not, not there, basically. Maybe, Clifton, could I invite you to... Um, just say a few words about yourself and where you are. Yeah, I'm Clifton Powell. I'm an artist, painter, musician. I would like to see myself as a, a realist, but um, it differs sometimes. I can go anywhere with it. I'm from, um, originally I'm from Jamaica, which is a very small island, very creative. Um, loads of farming, loads of fishing, loads of art, loads, loads of music. It's all there, you know, it's this compile like a seal box coming from Amazon with loads of stuff in it. And, you know, I did an island jump from Jamaica um, to England. I first went to London, which I was working with Temple Art in London. So I started doing connections from there. I did a few exhibitions. Uh, I'm living now, I'm living in Wiltshire. We're in the countryside. My home is back to back with a farm. My, my uh, nearest neighbor is um, maybe five, 600 meters um, down. And, you know, here I am continuing the work that I always do from I was about seven. I've been, I've been painting since I was seven year old. And, and, and I went to Jamaica School of Art, which is called now the Cultural Training Center, or some cultural center. They changed the name over time because I've been here a long time now. The island life that I'm coming from, I don't think it's that far apart um, from a, a British life. It's only you get more sunshine, and with sunshine, you get a lot of energy. June, welcome back, June. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> it's the phone just decided to stop. We're talking about mm-hmm. friendship and West Papua, but you're also talking about where you uh, are right now as well. Yeah. I, I just find it, I just, I just really want to acknowledge that, you know, throughout this process, you're really um, giving voice to those islands which may may not have any voice at all. I'm, I'm expecting really, really great um, connections, reconnections, um, ideas flowing, inspiration. Um, and that was like what, what the, the friendship mural was about, you know, um, making that connection. You, I mean, the images are just the joining of the hands, which is the initial, you know, meeting. And then it goes on from there, all the lovely things that flow from the initial meeting. And, you know, I, I really love that human nature, what occurs beyond all sorts, sorts of um, stipulations and restrictions. And so despite the media blockade of West Papua, you know, we still get messages. We still hear stories. We still have communications because of that 
initial contact um, between humans, I'll just say humans, <laughs> but um, from all over the world, um, people connecting at a heart and, and spirit and, and intellectual level and making wonderful things happen. I love it. I love it so much. And you can't predict these things, really. And finally, can we move on to Gail? I have a very complex relationship with islands. My, my mum is Scottish. She's got blonde hair. So I grew up in a very, a very cold um, Edinburgh. But my dad is Chinese Mauritian, and he's part of quite a complex diasporic um, move from uh, of Han Chinese in the 19th and 20th uh, centuries to Mauritius. Um, and Mauritius is an island that was under Dutch, French, and uh, British colonial rule. Mm. So islands of the, they're sort of uh, tropes that I've um, revisited. Um, and also thinking about archipelago, it feels like almost we're a kind of archipelago, all of us here, and that the, there's connections, it's very different. Uh, relationships and different um, island situations. But where I am just now, I'm actually in a, not not the most peaceful place in the world, but a very uh, lively place. I'm in Leytonstone in East London. Um, so it's an area that is definitely a bit warmer than Scotland, but there's a lot going on. Um, I'm also a single mum to two young boys, a six year old and a 12 year old. And my life, um, according to everybody, is quite busy and hectic. <laughs> So I think I've managed to find, I don't have space and kind of um, horizon and things in a, in a spatial sense, but um, I, I found my own sort of peace within that. And I think um, being an artist is, is a way to also do that as well. Thank you so much. There's just so much I want to talk about. What I was interested about is the Occidental imagination rather than the Oriental imagination. What I mean by that is, how coming from a small island, uh, as I did, I imagined the motherland, the big island, the, that Britain was this wonderful land paved with gold. And when I got here, it was like, uh, no. <laughs> so the Im imaginary of the motherland, so the opposite to the European imagination. And then this idea of a gateway, June, like where islands are gateways. So I'm, I'm just peppering your thoughts with all these. The definition of island is um, land surrounded by sea. I think everywhere is surrounded by sea, really. Ages ago, the land used to be connected, but it break away and form an island. Like, you know, so um, that's how I think. Island is just, that's what I was taught, really. Island is land that's surrounded by sea. I mean, for me, the island is uh, really being... Um... Uh, finding your own solutions, being very kind of self-sufficient, finding, um, that's why you, you need each other on the island. So you help each other and, you know, at least that's what I've, especially with the pandemic, that's what I've really uh, experienced here on Bantayan Island. And we've been self-sustainable, which is, we were so lucky. We, we had the sea, we had fish, fresh fish, seafood, uh, farming, um yeah we were okay but, but you also yeah. had the typhoon recently didn't yeah, you? yeah well yeah i, I wanted course, to ask yeah, you have. about that actually how how have you and how have the islanders coped with that i mean we're used to having typhoons it's just that they're getting very strong now and so um they're, they're dangerous and they destroy a lot so uh the good thing about a typhoon is that you can kind of uh prepare for it <laughs> Unless, you know, you see other things happening in the world now, you know. Um, uh, the, the recent uh, typhoon Odette, we were lucky that Bantayan Island wasn't hit as badly as the typhoon Haiyan in 2013. But yeah, many people were affected and but people were helping each other. This time there was not, there was no international aid, but people really helped each other, which was very good to see. Why was there no international aid? Well, I think just busy with COVID, busy right. with other things, yeah. But in a way that was good also, because then, you know, people really have to get up and help each other. So there were so many, uh, not just the, the local government units helping each other, but also uh, volunteers, uh, people giving, like there were a lot of initiatives from the island here, um, bringing fresh water on trucks, um, yeah. 
So that, that, that those are looking at the good things, you know, happening mm -hmm. when bad things happen, these natural disasters happen. I was, so I was just thinking about the sea as well in, in relation to um, the, the work that's in the exhibition, um, Waste Archipelago that I did was um, partly sort of came from a, um, an, an anger that Mauritians felt when there was the MV Wakashio oil spill. It was a um, Japanese oil tanker that um, sort of illegally went very close to the, the bay in Mauritius, mm. had this horrific spill. Um, the government in action, you know, and, and Mauritius is, is a very sort of skewed towards tourism, which is also a sort of legacy of colonial. Um, so when the coastline is affected, it affects everything. It's mm -hmm. the economy, it's um, the fishing, it's... And um, Mauritians were so incensed by the lack of, they just seemed to be, it was very slow, any response to this oil spill that was washing up in the beaches that um, started making homemade ballasts using mm. um, sort of tights with straw and also human hair. So they were collecting hair from um, hairdressers and also people donating hair. And that's a thing that's been used in a few environmental sort of oil spot disasters and oil spills where local people have had to take um, sort of quite immediate action and do things in a way. And actually it's one of the more environmentally friendly ways to soak up the oil as well. Um, so it's just thinking about that, that mm. uh, the kind of, um, the islands are also always surrounded by these, these global trade movements that mm. we always see this momentary um, horrific sort of oil spills, but all the time that, that danger, they're being encircled. Mm. Yeah, your your work, Gail, has made me think a lot about the idea of islands as wasteland. I mean, because the work that you're doing is a lot to do with waste. Um, and it really made me think about islands as wasteland or or because it, as you were speaking, it gave me this memory of when I was a teenager. Um, the French government decided to do nuclear testing in the South Pacific. Uh, and it was almost as if, oh, it's wasteland. We can test our nuclear bombs in the South Pacific near these islands uh, and nobody would be affected because no one's there. Uh, so this kind of imaginary, the European imaginary of the island as wild or wasteland where no one is affected and there are no communities. Uh, so that, that is quite interesting. And actually that, that goes back to in, in medieval times, um, as part of the research that I've been doing is looking into uh, notions of uh, the marvels, which were sort of ideas of uh, people that had distorted bodies and straight that, that lived on the edge of the world. And islands, because they were surrounded by water, were always seen as being morally um, problematic. So, so wilderness and wildness and water has, has always in the European imagination for, for hundreds of years has sort of been a place where um, yes, almost like uh, up, up, the periphery on a, in a moral sense as well as a geographical sense. So if you take things like uh, medieval maps, like the Hereford map or the kind of Teal map, you would always have at the center um, Christendom and, and the city and, the, and then out in the out, outlying uh, areas, you'd have the islands and always very quite, you know, they weren't, um, it wasn't geographically realistic, but always with water around. And somehow that water in the in the European imagination from early on, water became a, a sort of moral delineation, as did wilderness of of a of a of a non of non-human qualities. I know this seems quite extreme to, but I think in the sort of racism and European imagination that, that still continues. Um, but in the UK, water surrounding our island, we also it, that racism can be uh, inverse, so that you think there's something special about our island, which clearly isn't. June, did do you have any thoughts on what an island, what islands mean to you? Yeah, well, I, I was just getting a little bit lost in my thoughts just then because, um, you know, we're dealing with um, language that is not of our kind of vocabulary. I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, it's modern day now, 2022, and of course we all know what an island. But I was just, I was reflecting on my old people and the idea that we didn't have this mass communication that we have, and and we had a lot of 
uh, connection with islands and a lot of toing and froing, um, you know, even from as far as China, where they hop through the islands to come, come down to my country to get what we call trepang. I don't know if you heard of trepang at all. It's a sea cucumber. But, you know, way back in my grandparents' um, uh, in, in our history, we had visits from China that would come down through Indonesia and island hop all the way down to my country, Larakia country, and, and trade and go back again. It's all mm -hmm. seasonal. But I was thinking of the idea that, uh, that our people didn't really have that knowledge about where they were coming from and which, you know, and how big these land masses were or weren't or, you know, it was a bit of an unknown. So I suppose I was a little bit lost in my thoughts as you were talking. Uh, the, the, the concept of island, like, like I say, is I was trying to imagine that we're actually, we represent it in paintings and stuff. Uh, but I don't know this idea, this terminology island. of I've got to think about that a little bit more. Mm. Um, from a cultural perspective and, and, and how we view the world, our worldview about land masses and um, mm. like our worldview of Ireland and mm. what that means and how we would represent that, I guess, mm. in, our, in our talking and our paintings and all that kind of a thing. Mm. I suppose I'm thinking a little bit backward here. I'm thinking probably two or three generations before me Mm -hmm. um, and of course, now we all have the 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 magic of mass media and 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 our modern day knowledges and stuff. But I was just thinking of the the terminology and the concept of where that come from. That um, um, people who live on islands or people that are not of their like I'm, I suppose you're talking about the the European um, people who came or colonized. And or whether they colonized or whether they what didn't or whatever, but their thinking, their intellect, and what they're thinking about the people that live in these areas. In in the case of my people, they put us even below the flora and the fauna. We're not even nothing, and it's evidenced. Um, and and we're dealing with this horrible um, view of us as a people, we, we have no problem that we are a people, we are a sovereign people, we have, we've got rights, we've got this and that, and yet the treatment we receive from the uh, colonizers is so far removed from that reality. They don't even put us as a, above a plant. We feel the effects of their intellect. We feel the effects of how they view us I suppose I'm just speaking about my people at the moment I'm sorry but I would mm -hmm. say that, that it kind of goes out to a lot of uh, indigenous people across the planet and particularly across the islands <coughs> where we've been affected by what they think or don't think even in West Papua now um, those people don't even have human rights and what does that mean does that mean that the um, the invaders don't even recognize that they are humans and that they have human rights mm -hmm. for them to be not you know it's a mystery because i'm sure the whole you know this is 2022 we all know that people have human rights and yet um i mean, even what's going on now in the ukraine it's, it, it it beggars belief that um and you think well what don't these people even think that these people are human that they can just be treated so or disregarded so, and I think it's it's a real problem with the world view about uh, land and people, and I th I think it's a lack of learning or a lack of mm. education. Um, yeah, I don't know. It brings a lot of it raises the a lot of is that those systems are still in place until today. That's really the big yes. problem. Yes, we, we are Batayan, a group of islands is supposed to be a protected wilderness area, but the, the way it was presented, because people don't understand what it means that the land should be lifted, that there's a bill being proposed now in the Senate to lift 
to lift it from being a, a protected wilderness area. The way it was explained when I went to the public hearing was that the only thing wild left on this island are your wives, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's it. So, you know, it's still until today. Uh, and, you know, these are some of the things that I'm involved in, but people have been uh, uh, erased or uh, given that way of thinking for so long that they accept it, you know, that's why we're in this mess right now. And it's such a slow process to, to also get young people to, to understand, you know, what, why, why, why it is the way it is and, and what we can even do about it. Yeah, so Martha, I was really interested about whether, how that speaks to some of your work about um, certain communities being erased just through environmental and economic survivability you know yeah. like the fishermen versus the um seafarers in your yeah world. change is coming so fast you know i mean now that commercial fishing came in uh small fisher folks don't have anything anymore they do illegal fishing dynamite fishing out of desperation they go compressor diving because they're desperate and so their children are becoming international seafarers. So many Filipinos are, are, are seafarers. And um, when they come home, there's such a dislocation. Even just understanding what's happening here. So many Filipinos go overseas to work. And, um, you know, that's why working here in the Philippines on this island, coming home where my father's from and where I grew up also, um, there's no choice. You become uh, in, in, intertwined with politics, uh, policies. Uh, you become some kind of an activist because you know you see the cracks and the breaks in the system, and it. And you need to participate. You need to be part of the solution. You can't just, you know, uh, throw rocks at it. You need to somehow make it happen together there are good people in the system and that there are people we can work with you know like uh and the things that i've learned since the pandemic uh we we just uh, a group small group of us uh just created like an official association and now we are organizing uh international fisher folks day on the 28th of april and we're making a resolution that this will happen every year and so everyone is going to come together get on the water we get to talk about fisher folk rights um, the local government unit will do presentations as well as the people's organizations and we're going to have an open forum and we're going to try to have a party, um, you know, because we need to somehow find a way for all of us to learn from each other and move forward. Mm. The guns, the, they can bring their guns as well. Let's all go. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, because you know? like in some of your work, you also showed the fact that there were guns, there was drugs. Yeah, I mean, it's and part it's complicated of, society. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, when the lockdown happened here, I mean, there were machine guns on all the checkpoints, you know, and it was normal. You know, there were orders to shoot if you disobey. So, you know what I mean? So, uh, it. how do you say, even with COVID, when people dying from COVID, it's just normal here that people die. It's not really like a big drama, like in Europe, you know, where these statistics are, are scary. People here are like, I got to eat. I have to work. <laughs> you know, life goes on. Yeah, I mean, and in a sense, the flip side to that is that death goes on as well. I mean, life goes on and death goes on. Yeah. But this very interestingly brings us to this question I wanted to ask all of you really is how does politics and activism inform your practice or integrate itself into your practice and to what extent small islands uh, like jamaica and stuff they look up to um to the bigger um continent government system and the rest of it is run by what the continent says like what england is doing what america is doing and the all of these countries and we are only shadows of those countries and, and unless unless you switch off and do what you do because the people live on uh, the island of jamaica they were originally slaves they came from africa i am what um 
one, two, three, four, maybe the fourth generation of, of slaves. So, you know, that's where all the music and the creativity come from because there was nothing else for these people. And these people, when, when, when um, the British went to that island, it was um, occupied um, by just little bits and pieces of the island of Arawak Indian. Um, and then they came in and they, you know, bribed them. And sooner or later, they take over the island. You know, people take island people as nobody really, you know, of people are there to use. People just, you know, put you in a category, yeah, when you come from a small island. Disregarding that this is an island and the same thing goes on here in a more diplomatic and a higher standard. <laughs> is this, is this, that's why I said I was island jumping because it doesn't look any different to me. And when you say the girl was here with gold, you come and say, all right, where's the gold then? <laughs> it's good that I've lived here a long while. So, you know, it's good that you can accept the fact of what is going on but you know that you have to pay, play an important part within your society because it's not everybody concerned i think it's just it's a hot it's it's something to do with you know creativity and an artistic mentality to get involved in anything that is going on because some people just don't care they just try to survive and they don't want to get involved but they they categorize the island, and that's why we have things like continent. You know, when you hear the word continent, you know, it's just it's bigger than you, isn't it? It's just too big. I mean, the first time I went to like Germany and this, because I do music over there, and Czech Republic, and you know, I'm I didn't know that it was a different country because what I know if if a place is called Germany and a place is called um, France, it is cut off by sea. I didn't know that it was a whole continent. Although um, it was, uh, you know, you could notice that from your, your atlas or your, your maps in Jamaica, but nobody care about that because everybody is just busy. It's when you go to the continent now and travel, you say, hang on a minute, it's just the same place. Germany, France, uh, it, it's just one massive island and they call it continent. And Germany have loads of it. And Russia have loads of it. <laughs> and they still want more. <laughs> I mean, we, we have to be clear. We have to be caring of what is going on around us. And that is why I come up with unrest and stuff. I'm doing uh, painting as well. That gives me peace and tranquility. Like remembering water, remember fishes and, you know, remember people life, you know, mm. people laughing, you know, because that is more history than real history. People having fun and working together. I'm happy with it because it gives me the sense of creativity. There's nothing to do here than create. I was just thinking that's a really interesting question there about the artist studio as island and how much of that needs to be a place of just being on your own island so that you can yeah. work. Yeah. I, I was also really struck um, by what both you, Clifton, and what June had just said before about you saying that, well, actually the whole continent is an island, like the whole Eurasian <laughs> continent is one massive island, which really, um, goes against our normal definition of Ireland. And then yeah. June, when, when I asked her about what she thought of Ireland, she actually, her response was our people as, and I assume she means the Larrakia people of the Aboriginal North, Northern Territories. Yeah. She said, yeah. our people don't really have this concept of Ireland. Yeah. And that made me think, oh, maybe the whole idea of Ireland in the first place is a European concept that if you were an islander, you don't think I live on an island. I'm no. just, I just live here. Yeah. Basically. This yeah. is my reality. It's not an island. It's just my reality. Yeah. So 
when did this concept of Ireland appear? And yeah, that's that's what it is. It's a categorization of uh, you know like Europeans. You know, they mm. categorize everything. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> So <laughs> we're all um, creatures of images first before language mm. and, and the amazing thing about art and images and things that can't be neatly categorized is that they can remain ambiguous and complex mm. and one place I, I spent two years um, in was in northeast Durham which is an area where there used to be lots of mines and the mining community was was huge. And then in the 1980s under Thatcherism, that just, it almost disappeared within five years, this enormous industry and community disappeared. And people within Northeast Durham, because there's very little mobility, it's, it's the least, um, the, the lowest level of car ownership. They talk about feeling as though they've been, they're an island. I think it's, a, it's, it's really, it's a community. But they they interpret it with, with with their own interpretation because what that is categorized as a community. Because you can have a wider community and a small community. Like you know, I am outside of Salisbury, but I am in this community of Wiltshire. And I think in Northeast Durham, what what they talked about is that they had to be so self sufficient because the industry went, the, the very little funding has come in. It's lots of community um, centers that were all mining halls and mm. everybody runs things for each other. The sense of community is, is incredible, but it's mm. had to be, yeah. quite, in some way it's had to be quite insular because mm. nobody, they feel like nobody else has really cared. Mm. Nobody's come into it. So, so we've kind of had to, yeah, maybe that community thing mm. is really important, like you say, Cliff, and June mentioned. In fact, Marta mentioned this idea in the beginning of um, um, helping each other on the island and resilience, but really linking to this idea of self-sufficiency, Gail, that you're talking about. But in both instances, it's self-sufficiency because nobody else, you can't rely on other people to help you. Uh, and of course, I would say in, in, in England, it's, a, it's an extreme of that, which is, Actually, we do need other people, but we're just going to insist that we don't. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> the Brexit version. Yeah, we're going to be very extreme. <laughs> we're going to pretend we are self-sufficient when we're not, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Being from Singapore, um, I think Singapore suffers from a mentality of kind of a trauma from British Empire. So the reason why it, it needs to be so rich uh, and ne it needs to be so technologically future uh, facing is because of this trauma of being a country that has relied on Britain for 150 years or 200 years. In fact, the country was founded by Britain, right? So Britain was the mother that looked after it. And then in the war, when the Japanese invaded, suddenly Britain just abandoned Singapore and then we have the Japanese occupation all the atrocities that happened during the Japanese occupation of torture and mass killings especially of the Chinese population the the trauma of of being abandoned like that resulted in this country coming out of the war uh going we are never going to let that happen again and we're never going to let a European we're never going to rely on Europe ever again or rely on Britain ever again it's it's almost that kind of traumatic mentality which then set it on this like course of we're just going to be super super rich whatever it takes to be self-sufficient and then that's kind of I actually think it doesn't need to be that rich anymore like it's like super rich right you can just mm -hmm. stop being traumatized and just relax a bit like stop, stop yeah. trying to grow <laughs> but it's mm -hmm. just non-stop things that are going on in the um, in the curriculum and within the deba debate. So museums have had a sort of edict from the government saying, you are not allowed to talk about the colonial legacy unless it is completely 
positively putting a spin on. So there's a suppression of this kind of reality of the extraction that um, then Britain did of the colonies and the reliance. And then even things like the Windrush um, scandal that, mm. you know, and my father was part of that. He, he left on a boat when he was 17 and worked in the NHS in, in the UK. Um, that, that Britain invited all these, they weren't even seen as colonies because at the time with the Immigration Act, um, they were treated as British citizens, that then shifted. But this kind of pretense and it's- um, Yeah, when did that change? So that, that changed, well, it, I think it was um, uh, 1947 that the Immigration Act came in where they started to put restrictions on people coming because in, between 1943 and 1947, the, there was a, um, a policy that you could come from any of Britain's colonies and you were British. Mm. So the Windrush thing was where the Home Office then lost all the documentation. Uh, honestly, it makes me so angry when I think about all the things that are going on. Um, and the racism in Britain at the moment is of shockingly high levels. Well, I understand exactly where you're coming from with that. Um, with, with with the co colonial system, because I was born and grew up in it. Uh, you know, there's a lot I don't know about what went on on the ground. But if I didn't come to England, I wouldn't have that this international experience. And this is the, the, the thing that is big, massive island against small, tiny little island. And that is what's going on, you know what I mean? My island is bigger than yours. What have you got on yours? No light. <laughs> it's the school bully mentality. It, it's not like a say. That's why we can't talk to each other. We have war in Ukraine. We can't talk to Putin because we all do the same. And, you know, I mean, and we don't have respect for our neighbors and individual, whether they're black or white. So, if you don't second those things, Bob Marley said, until the color of a man's skin be of no significance than the color of his eye. It's rumors of war. You will have war to the end of the days if people don't come together. I thought when the pandemic started, I thought I'm going to work on this really, with this really small community. Life is going to be really simple, you know, we're just going to have a good time together. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, there was conflict on the island. Um, they have problem with the ownership of the island because it's a beautiful island. And so tourism is coming in. Um, they are fighting for their sea. They are fighting for an ordinance for the marine protected area. We just got it in January. They got it people from the Kiribati community mm -hmm. uh, who are also part of the exhibition. So uh, the Brisbane Kiribati community is, is um, showing, uh, uh, giving us a video of a dance, a uh, traditional Kiribati dance and showcasing. And then the UK Kiribati community is giving us uh, uh, artifacts and costumes uh, for us to display alongside. And, and I think what was important for me at least to have the Kiribati community there is this idea of an island in the South Pacific actually going to become completely yeah. submerged. Where are they going to go? The whole mm. country is going to disappear, basically. How is it or why is it that um, these topics about politics or world trade or whatever have to appear in your practice? I think, you know, I was just maybe born that way, feel that way you know, feel connected to what is going on. Yesterday, there was a pheasant in the, the yard. I think it was running from another pheasant outside. And I opened the gate and let it out. And as soon as it got out, there was a, another pheasant confronted it. And, you know, I get to understand those type of, you know, those little, um, those important little things that is going on around me. Uh, and that is not even government system or politics or anything, maybe is, is, um, is a natural political uh, mm. system mm. within the year. You know, there's a, other music say there's a natural mystic flowing in the wind, blowing in the wind. And if you, could, if you listen carefully, you will hear. Mm. And um, I get that chance to be out of the hustle and bustle and 
sat right in the middle of it. So, you know, it's like that song again. I don't know why I'm I'm going to song, but I can see clearly now when the rain have gone. Now, you know, I can see all obstacles in my way. And this is what I'm feeling. When I started here in 2010, it was really about being a kind of a witness or my images would be used to, to create dialogues and to get people to see themselves and, and start conversations. But like, you know, in 2017, we won this international, big international prize. And it really got me thinking because when I went home, I was really sad because nothing changed. It even got worse. And so it, it, it made me uh, frustrated thinking, you know, I should really focus on works that I maybe feel that I could, um, how do you say, um, really do some, or that I could actually change things a little bit more. I mean, you can't change things, it's too big, but, um, you know, that's why now um, really doing works that, uh, you know, you could partner with leaders and really try to do work together. I'll let you know in, in a year if, if, if my, if this new uh, way of working <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually way, effective, yeah. but <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, like uh, the, the, um, creating that platform for, for conversation is really good. But mm. at some point, I got a little bit. Um, it's not enough sometimes, you know. So rich, what both of you are saying, and that Clifton's really, you know, that is that attunement that you're attuned to the pheasants moving in your tune and. Mm. Um, the activism you're talking about, and I find myself doing more and more because in the UK, this government has cut um, funding for creative education. Yeah, yeah. Prevent, and it's cut like in half. So they're trying to be all science and technology. And so I find myself, a lot of my activism is actually working with young people. And okay, you know, I can't change, I can't change the world in a kind of, or you feel like, what am I doing? What can, what can kind of, but through doing very small things of workshops with young people of doing Important. what you're really doing is saying, you know, this is my attunement and I'm inviting you to, it's that, that sort of quality of attunement so that instead of us having to um, sort of, people feel like they have to go out and conquer the world or do awful things with this bully mentality, with that attunement, it, that's what the shift is. And it's a political mm. thing. It's, it's yeah. an activism in itself. Mm. Yeah. I, th I think when you're on an island for a long time, you don't really realize from a, a bird's perspective what's happening to you. And sometimes somebody needs to hold a mirror, maybe. Well, I think the only thing that I would say is like, really, does anybody have any final thoughts about what we've discussed or doesn't have to be about what we discussed or even like thoughts for the future? I, it's so important to have these conversations. I, I wish we could have them more often. You, we were just, we were now warming up and getting into it, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs>